Welcome to Video Village. Today we are talking about the Hunger Games. Bria, is it is this the best YA series that's come out of the 21st no. century? No. No. <laughs> what do you mean? Twilight came out of the 21st century. Okay. This is where I want to start. I think the I think Twilight is like they're not good movies. No, they're not good. But I think the Hunger I think the first two Hunger Game movies are genuinely good movies. Yeah, they are. And the books are even better. I think that I actually learned something when I read those books when I was young, you know? Wait, so like, what? then how, where does your argument come from that Twilight's better? I enjoyed them more. I feel like that <laughs> that accounts for something. No, to be honest, I'm I I'm just saying that to be like inflammatory i think that the hunger games are the best ya series like objectively the best ya series in the 21st century maybe of all time maybe i mean i don't think harry potter counts as ya right like i don't think something like that is te- yeah technically it could be but that's not really in the spirit of what we're talking about this is like dystopia like clearly like you know the formula when you see it yeah the divergence like, remember and the... there, there was like a yeah there was like a wave of dystopian ya novels that and maze I think runner like one, there was like matched that was a big one for like young girls young adult girls um. <laughs> match <laughs> matched yeah it was like you were put you got like a little algorithm that told you who your soulmate was and you got matched up with them because that's what every girl wants you know it honestly is and but then this girl and you were like basically forced to marry who you're i'm probably butchering this but you're forced to marry who like your the algorithm tells you to marry but then she falls in love with somebody else Ooh, this i love that they just take the same plot and just like apply a new attribute like okay this time we're gonna do it but it's like fighting like this time it's love but it's always like yeah <laughs> you've been sorted into a a Hogwarts house, I mean, a house, I mean, a faction, I mean, a lover. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, Whatever. all right. Yeah. <laughs> there was one where everybody had to get plastic surgery to look the same, and this girl was like, I don't want to look like everyone else, and ran away. <laughs> that one was a favorite of mine. <laughs> I'm glad that you know this, because clearly your, your YA knowledge goes far beyond the depths of my... Of my oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I read a lot of fantasy YA too, which was a little bit different, I guess. Um, I like read a lot of YA during COVID too because I feel like it's it's like easy to read but at the end you still like touch on all the like same complex topics that you would touch on in like a adult fiction novel so especially Hunger Games wow look at that transition back yeah I know you're getting good at this (laughs) (laughs) I also was well, I was going to say I was reading something, but that's a lie. I just watched a TikTok that told me that <laughs> Suzanne Collins is a screenwriter, actually, by trade. And that's why the book is so, like, concise and has, like, a beginning, middle, and end. And that she also collaborated on the script for the new one, the new Hunger Games. Oh, as in she, is she a writer on the film? Yeah, I think so. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um We'll, we'll talk about the the movie one I guess once we start ranking it but as like a series yeah. I think it's interesting because not a, I don't think a lot of franchises really do this like you would think that it, they did but they don't where the same director makes all of them the first Hunger Games I forgot who directs it but that's somebody else and then catching fire all the way through this it's been the same guy it's been Francis Lawrence who mm-hmm. did. Uh, obviously all of these, but he also did I Am Legend, starring Will, Will Smith, which is a very good movie. Um, and then he did Red Sparrow with Jennifer Lawrence like five years ago. Oh, yeah. Like the spy movie. Yeah, I never watched it. But I remember seeing a lot of promotional material for it. Um, so he's like a pretty good director. Um, and like he's just like the Hunger Games guy. Like Everything else is like <laughs> around this franchise. I'm sure by the time he's like done, he's going to have made like six or seven Um and I kind of like that because I feel like in this movie you can you can kind of tell that it's the same guy just stylistically. Like the first movie, like it feels so different than everything else Dude, that comes after it. What was that? Okay, I like that movie. I watched it recently, and like I don't know who the cameraman was. 
He was like literally filming it on an iPhone and he had like, like, he did not have like any of those stabilizer things. It was clear because the camera was <laughs> shaking up and down. It was shaky. It cam. was yeah. very difficult. <laughs> I, I actually, I think he, I think they overdid it. But I actually think it worked for parts of it. Like everything in the woods, I think it, the shaky cam works quite well, and it kind of makes some yeah. some moments intense. But then, like halfway through the games, because the games are long in the first movie, like halfway through, I'm mm. like, you I, you got to change it up. Like I've been seeing too much of the same thing. Yeah. Also, like there were parts where she's like in town, and they just like cut to a sad person eating a tiny piece of bread, and it's shaking, and yeah. I'm like. I don't know what this is supposed to convey that like they don't have cameras in District Twelve. Like I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I I think like one of the yeah. moments I remember from the first movie where the shaky cam did work well is when uh, Gale gets like uh, whipped and beaten in the square. Mm. Like a moment like that with the shaky cam, it's all obviously it would have been intense otherwise. But there's like a there's like a like mo- the movement there like really feels like she's like running up to stop him and it feels like you're like running there with her and like kind of distressed in the way she's distressed basically like when in moments of distress i think it works well but then like the opening shot is of her like trying to hunt a deer and it's like shaky as hell i'm like this actually would have worked pretty great if it was just peaceful steady cam so i don't know i mean it was a lot i think everyone jokes about it now but it was looking back it was, it was a lot of a lot of shaky cam but even with the shaky cam i feel like it's I, maybe it's like to the actor's it's like the actors that really brought it home, but they really still shined. That movie is so good. The first one. The first one is fantastic. Every, I cry every time. I I haven't watched. I've watched that movie like seven times. I've cried every single time when Rue dies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it hasn't really gotten better emotionally from that moment in in the first movie. Okay, let's just start with the rankings because yeah. I don't want to like spoil the rankings as we as we chit chat. There's five yeah, movies, yeah. so you have. Starting in, uh, oh gosh, was it 2012 Hunger Games came out? Um, yeah, 2012 mm-hmm. Hunger Games directed by directed by Gary Ross, our, our shaky cam expert, who also, geez, this guy's resume is not my favorite. Um, he directed Ocean's 8 in 2018. Um, oh. He also made, he was a writer on Big with Tom Hanks, which I, I think is a good movie, but he was also oh, a writer. Oh, that's a good movie. Um, but yeah, anyway, 2012 Hunger Games, and then... 2013, Hunger Games Catching Fire. 2014, wow, Mockingjay Part 1. And then 2015, Mockingjay Part 2. I didn't realize they came out that quickly. By the time 2015 yeah. was about, was done, it was done. Yeah, I didn't either. But I guess I was actually watching an interview with Francis Lawrence and he was saying that they filmed everything together and they just had to cut it into two because the like studios wanted them to be two movies. That makes sense. That was kind of the start of like everything being cut to two. Like after Harry Potter, they're yeah. like, "Well, you can make a lot of money doing this." Um, yeah. All right. What do you think is the? Oh, and then of course, twenty twenty three, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. What do you think is uh, the worst Hunger Games movie? Um. Okay. Honestly, I like all of them. I have to preface that because even though it's the worst, I still enjoy watching it. It's um, Hunger Games Mockingjay Part One for me. Okay, uh, my number five is is part two, uh, but but I mean I'm glad we at least agree that it's the Mockingjay movie. <laughs> yeah, and it's close. I think I I kind of I like the first one better because I I think it slowed down. Like I think it was not nearly as intense as the rest of the series, but I liked the exploration into the politics. I was disappointed at like how like the the one tense scene is when they go rescue Peta from the Capitol, and they yeah. instead choose to cut away from the action. Because like the feed goes out, like the, the, they're watching on a feed, and then you, you cut back and forth to Mahershala Ali as like this soldier leading his men, uh, and leading Gale also, I guess. Uh, and then the, the feed cuts out, and then it's like fifteen minutes or something of just like Jennifer Lawrence and Julianne Moore just like vibing and talking, and I'm like, this is the end of the movie. Like this is not an exciting way to close this out. Already, no. it's all it wasn't exciting. So yeah, I mean, I. I think they're fairly interchangeable for me, unless you have part two, like, at number three. I, I have part two at number five and part one at number four. Me too. I have part two at number four. They are interchangeable for me too. I guess the only reason why I put part one first is because they just kind of sit around a lot. And I know it's, like, 
supposed to be like you're saying an exploration of like district 13 and their political system but i don't know if that necessarily comes across really well because i remember when i watched part two the first time and when i watched it this time it wasn't super clear to me that um the president coin was you know hungry for power and like um kind of vying to be in the same position as president snow and if part one was well executed, then that would have been clear to me. Like, that I would have a good understanding of um, what, why Katniss would kill President Coyne at the end. So that's why part one is my lowest. But yeah, they're both interchangeable for me. I feel like both of them don't do a great job. And also, I haven't read the books recently, but I don't remember PETA being, like, both the, like, secretary of state and the primary like military operative and a foot soldier like not sorry not pita gail right why is gail in every single position in this government like i'm so confused i don't know i never read the books (laughs) i have no idea why (laughs) i read the first book when i was 10 or something like that i don't know um some reader like get back to us on that please yeah yeah right into video village uh there's a space for you on Spotify to uh, answer a Q&A. We get a lot of responses every every single episode. You but, can text me here. Yeah, you can text answer. me at 919. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, Mockingjays were not good. Definitely a letdown, but also I'm pretty happy that we still got the prequel series movie despite uh, Mockingjay Part 2. That just like, I feel like everyone agrees. It just like wasn't a good conclusion. Um, yeah. so I'm kind of like still, I'm excited that we got the ballad, but I'm also like, okay, like, I don't know why financially anyone thought that it would, that would work, but it did, I guess. I know it did work really well. I think that it was because, because there was such a long time gap, every, like it didn't fall to the same, like, t- like, I feel like everybody was tired of, or they were like fatigued by these dystopian novels and dystopian movies. So we came at it, like, really fresh, rearing for a new, like, franchise film, you know? Yeah, that's fair. It's been eight years since Mockingjay Part 2. And then I feel like we've, like, like, Shailene Woodley is no longer, no longer like, in all the movies. So I we're know. like, all right, we're, we're resetting now that we're, we're past that phase. Um, okay, let's jump to number three on our list. I, I have, this is where I have the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Um, yeah, me too. Okay. <laughs> I, I with the disclaimer that this is good. I, I like this movie. I think it's actually a good movie, um, unlike the Mockingjay films. Um, without getting into too much detail, uh, why do you have this above Mockingjay and below the the last two? I really like this movie. Um, I went to watch it with my family, and um, it was like a crowd pleaser. Like everybody enjoyed it, which my whole family enjoyed Hunger Games one when we watched that like a long time ago, which is why they were like, okay, yeah, we'll go watch this too. And um, I think that it was interesting how it was, you know, it took the Hunger Games world, but made it like more of a musical, which I I think I liked. Um, but the reason why it's not above the other two movies is that it really felt – it did not feel enmeshed in the real world in the same way that um, the other two movies that we have yet to discuss do. It felt like I was watching like a filmy, like it felt filmy, which is not a bad thing, but it definitely felt like, you know, I was watching a movie rather than I was, I was watching a movie meant to be watched as like a experience, a fil- a a movie experience rather than a movie that was meant to like be watched to like contemplate the future. The first two Hunger Games films were about the Hunger Games and the world. And this Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is about one man. It's an anti-hero film. It's literally like your classic hero to villain story. And so you're not really focusing on the politics. You're introduced to it and it definitely like serves as a character and as like a, a push and pull in this film. But like Snow is the, the whole movie, um, which I, I found like riveting at times and really fun. And at times with the, the musical, some of the musical aspects I thought were a little overdone, but in general uh, I liked, but I think in, overall the runtime 
probably could have been like 30 minutes shorter. I'm not saying that like they shouldn't have told the whole story that, that they did, but I think that like some moments could didn't have to be as drawn out as they were. I'm not exactly sure where I would make cuts. I probably need to watch it again. Because like the beginning was fun. The ending was cool. Maybe some stuff in the middle, I guess. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but did you also feel, I agree with you fully, it was much more insular, which I, I, yeah, I guess I wasn't expecting. But also, I liked the set in that it was like both modern or, or both um, futuristic and vintage. But it really took me out of the world because I liked how, how as we were talking about earlier, the first movie was like such like a documentary style film and it was so real yes. and it was like filmed in North Carolina it literally looked like my backwoods like it it made me connect to it much more because I mean it just felt much more like what I see in the real world but this like interesting I guess it is a period piece of some sort set like took me out of the Hunger Games world a little bit um, and also, um, Rachel Zegler's uh, part, she was really good. She's a good singer, but it just kind of like wasn't really a full – She, I feel like she wasn't really a full character in Human. She was like a point of obsession for President Snow. But because she wasn't like a fleshed out character, I kind of like was left not really feeling for her at the end. It's the like, major – um, pressure points of the film like the major emotional pressure points of the film I didn't necessarily feel anything for her I, t- I completely um. agree I felt the exact same way I, 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 I also think she was really good I think she was like maybe a little miscast but more so I think you're right I think the script just doesn't really serve her character that well and I think that's why the southern accent ended up kind of annoying me because I was like she does not really feel like a Southern Belle. Like, we don't know enough about her to sell me on the concept that Rachel Ziegler is, Ziegler, Ziegler, whatever, is a Southern Belle. And because, yeah. especially because, we like, <laughs> pop culture-wise, we've seen a lot of her over the last year in the press. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I the parts that worked, actually, I actually did quite enjoy. Um, I think the... I won't ruin it. I, we can talk about this after the rankings. But yeah. th- one of the climactic moments in the middle of the movie where she she sings, I was like, okay, cool. I forgot that we're watching a YA movie. Like I, I had to, to kind of like temper myself. I was like, yeah, this is this would be hype if I was thirteen, no doubt. Um, yeah. I yeah. Totally, I I don't know. I don't think it's all her fault. I feel like it's no. I don't think it's her like fault at all. Script's fault. Yeah, but I think yeah. she's very charming. I, I think she was great. Yeah, she was good. If she maybe, but then maybe if they gave her more meat, then that would take away from the point of the story. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm not exactly. I'm not. I mean, maybe you spend more on time focusing on her character and less on some of the stuff that they showed. But that being said, like it was a it was a long story. It was a big story, but I think like it did flow well. It had it had good points of inflection. You know where it's going halfway through. Like you can kind of see, but like it still was satisfying to see the whole kind of arc of the story. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I went went into that movie not expecting a good movie and I was like thoroughly surprised. I was like, oh, that's like, yeah, it's a good good 2023 movie. I don't know, I was really happy. Yeah, and I found myself listening to the music after, like on my drive. Yeah, yeah, Rachel's covers of some of the stuff, yeah, they're they're, they're pretty good. Yeah. Like The Hanging Tree, that, that was solid. That was good. I like the one. Yeah, what is that song called? What? The song where she's like, can't take them at home. Nothing you can take from me. That one's good. Oh. <laughs> I can tell it made such a big impact on you. You had to ask your sister like four times for the name. <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, Dia, you read the books recently. This point is what means <laughs> um, why is Gail, why does Gail have every single governmental position in uh, District 13? This, wait, get her closer oh, to the she mic. Know. Like, oh, she doesn't know? Never mind, never mind. Why? There's a good chance that Suzanne Collins is, also does not know. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, what, what's in your number two? Um, the first one. Up until today, that wasn't the case for me, but I actually agree with you. I think, uh, the original Hunger Games is the second best Hunger Games movie and not the first. 
Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I always had the most fun in Catching Fire, but I, for whatever reason, I always walked away from what, Catching Fire being like, the first one was just a better movie, which still might be yeah. the case, but like, Catching Fire is like, is like kind of, kind of the per- the perfect sequel for what it is. Like, you get everything you want. You the games are bigger and better. It's more intense. You get really cool character development. The world gets darker, and I guess we're talking about Catching Fire now. But yeah, Catching Fire is the best Hunger Games movie. I'm just gonna start with like the aspect ratio change that occurs when Katniss Dude, Everdeen the goes up. The cinematography. Oh. Oh my god it was it's insane so that moment because what's his face gets killed right in front of her the glass closes on her sinna <laughs> yeah his blood is on the glass she goes up she's in this massive field the aspect ratio changes i watched it on like i i assume you watched them recently i also watched them like earlier this year and i completely forgot about how crazy that moment was and i was like i was like on my feet i got up out of my chair and i was like oh let's go so yeah, there's some really great moments in Catching Fire. And of course, like the ending and all of like the climax and your know, introduction to the politics. And then what's his face? Philip Seymour Hoffman with his like kind of like hidden role and ends up revealing himself as a good guy at the end. His, I think one of his final film roles before his tragic death, just yeah. banger, banger act, like role for, for such a good actor. Uh, yeah, so I, I love The Hunger Games, Catching Fire. I, I thought that was great. Yeah, the cinematography in that movie is so good. Um, going back to Hunger Games Part 1, originally it was my favorite for a long time because I know a lot of the people that are extras in that movie. I don't know if you have the same experience, but it was filmed in Shelby. And so I was in middle school at the time. And everybody in the audience, when like um, Katniss volunteers, is supposed to be like you know, middle school aged, high school aged. So like I know a bunch of people that are that are in the Reaping Day. Wow, that's crazy! I had no so, idea. I, I think I remember the casting call, but I don't think I know anyone personally. I don't know. So I remember being like going to the movie and being like, "Wow, that's like I know some people in there." Um, but both Hunger Games Part One and I guess primarily Hunger Games Part Two, it makes North Carolina look so pretty, especially when she goes hunting. Um, and there's that one scene in front of the lake. I think it's like in all the promotional material. She's like crouching by the lake and uh, it's so gorgeous. And um, also the uh, score in that movie is really good. Ooh. Um, I remember when the aspect ratio changes and there's like that building like crescendo. It just like adds to the effect. Um, also, um, what's his name? That was like the talk of the town in 2014, whenever it came out. Sam Claflin, still hot. Who's that? Finnick Who's O'Dare. Oh, Finnick, yeah. They 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 did him so dirty in Mocking J Part Two. I know they that did, was like tough. really like took away. Also, I remember when I read the books, his like um, reveal to everyone that like um, Snow used to traffic him was like a really big deal. And they really took every, like, they made it, like, such a, like, plot device in Mockingjay Part 1. So, that sucked for him. Yeah, that was tough. <laughs> um, um, by the way, the score to the Hunger Games movies is done by James Newton Howard, um, who I think most famously worked with Hans Zimmer on The Dark Knight. But he also has done Peter Pan, King Kong, I Am Legend. Sixth Sense. Uh, one more. I'll say one more because five is a good number. Uh, Michael Clayton. Did you see that movie? Nope. It's a good one. George Clooney. Um, yeah, so that's fun. Yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about like specific movies. I think the first two are like pretty stellar compared to the rest of the series. Did you know that she um, actually lost her hearing in her left ear while filming that movie? No, why? Yeah. You know that scene where um, they all go to the cornucopia and it starts spinning? Yes. Um, Jennifer Lawrence actually lost hearing in her left ear during that scene. Oh, my. (laughs) That's pretty intense. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for you. Okay. In line with our Hot British Men episode, um, rank the three main boys. Yeah, Peter, Gail, and Finnick. 
no, I meant Peta Gale and Snow, but you can't do it based oh. on personality. It's we can all do looks? a four. Let's add Finnick. Why not? Four main boys. Yeah, based on looks, at the bottom of my list, I will go Gale or Liam Hemsworth. Okay. Um, just based off looks, that's really tough because I, I know the, I know the top of my list. I'm trying to just decide the middle. <laughs> um, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go number three. I'll go uh, Peta or, or Josh Hutcherson. Then number two, I'll go Finnick O'Dare. Who? What? What was the actor's name? Sam Claflin. Yeah, Cla- Mr. Claff. <laughs> and then I'll go <laughs> number one. I'll go um, the future president Snow, played by Tom Blythe. Who really? He was he was just like hot. Like he he got he gets hotter as the movie goes on. Yeah, I guess I liked him when he was deranged. You would in the woods. <laughs> that was kind of hot. But other than that, I don't know. I, I didn't really see the vision. Everybody else around me seemed to see the vision. I was like, I don't, I I don't get it. Yeah, the, I mean, I saw the vision before the buzz cut, and then the buzz cut, I was like, oh, I mean, this is what enlightenment feels like. Like, I really yeah. see a lot more <laughs> things now. Uh, yeah, he was he was hot. I'm glad they made him hot, because otherwise that movie would have felt longer. Yeah, that's true. Um, mine is, bottom is, I'm sorry, I love PETA, but based off of looks, Josh Hutcherson. And then... Fair, fair, yeah. Liam Hemsworth. And then Tom Blythe. Last but not least, Finnick. Sam Claff. The Claff. He got claffed up. Should we get a <laughs> teen perspective? Dia. Yeah. What? what? Rank all the Hunger Games boys. How old is your sister? 15? She's 16. 16? She's prime Perfect. Hunger Games material. Yeah, so you're this prime, prime audience. teenage. Do you want to go into the mic? Guest I've appearance. I've been waiting my whole life. To speak into a mic? No, to rank the Hunger Games boys. <laughs> okay. Um, Phoenix, number one. We're going bottom yeah. to top. But... Oh, okay, okay. Josh Hutcherson, bottom. Gail. You guys are related. Okay, yeah. You're going to do the same thing I Tom did. Tom Blythe. <laughs> Phoenix. Yeah. Wait, yeah. I feel like there's more, though. There's more what? There's more boys. More boys? Not any relevant ones. Not really. Ones. Yeah, not relevant ones. Yeah, that was fun. Um... Yeah, Tommy Tommy Blighty is a hot a hot guy. I, maybe I need to rewatch just for Finnick just to make sure. He, he yeah, in Catching Fire he was hot. The, the rest of the series I wasn't really into him. Mm, that's um, true. Let's take a quick break, listeners. When we come back, we're gonna be talking about uh, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I like this movie. I thought it was good. Uh, I guess we can start with just like where I think like like where young adult movies are now. I feel like like we were saying earlier, there was a wave in the 2010s, and I feel like that wave is like pretty much dead now. Like it feels like that feels like a a distant time, even though it was literally, I mean, the last Hunger Games movie before this came out eight years ago, and then you had a couple others afterwards. But I think like. The way, the way like the prime consumers of those movies watch movies has changed, and so it's almost like this feel this feels refreshing because it's almost like shocking how long of a movie this is just because of what teenage audiences what must be must be like. So I was really happy to see that it like kind of took its time. I thought when I, I'll be honest when I, when I saw the runtime, I was just like, this is stupid. Like no Hunger Games movie needs to be almost three hours long, and. Maybe I still feel that way, but I think the way they did this, I was like, okay, this isn't really a Hunger Games movie. This is actually like, it's kind, of, it's like an anti-hero movie. It's like if it's like if Draco Malfoy had a movie about him. Like it's, it's kind of I don't know. I, I, what did you think about the runtime? Let's start there. I didn't think about it. I didn't know the runtime going in, and actually, surprisingly, I left the movie feeling like I needed more, like we talked about <laughs> earlier. Not like not because I was like I just need more Hunger Games. I mean I do I always do, but like because I felt like some of the characters were not super fleshed out, like Rachel Ziegler's character or Zegler. Sorry, Rachel. Um, but she's, she's listening for sure. Yeah, maybe she is. Yeah, she's yeah. A- I'm, I'm being serious. She is. 
My podcast is big now, didn't you hear? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Post Rocky <laughs> Arani. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I felt like I needed more development between both of them to feel. Well, are we doing spoilers? Yeah, this is not spoiler territory. So, okay. listeners, if you if you haven't seen this movie and you care about spoilers, see you bye. But uh, if you don't care, then we're gonna we're gonna get into it in the next yeah. thirty minutes. I'm not your mom. Um, what? Listen if you want to listen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what's the connection there? <laughs> um, yeah, I felt like I wanted more of that. I felt like I wanted more of um, Hunter Schaefer because I really like her. And I wanted to see their relationship more because I know that later on in the story or between Hunger Games and um, the end of this story, he ends up betraying her. Um, right, Hunter Schaefer plays Tigress for the listeners. Yes, yeah, and so I would like, I would have liked to see maybe um, some of. I mean, I think they have one interaction at the end, but um, maybe more of that dynamic. Yeah, but at the same time, it was long, and I enjoyed it, and I left, and I felt like I got my fair share. So maybe that's the point of a movie. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, it's a complete story. And I was like, all right, like, if you didn't like it, that's totally fair. But you can't say that they didn't tell a full story. Like, they really, they took their time. They went through. The, some of the characters were underdeveloped. But, like, the main story was about Snow, and Snow got, he got a full arc. Um, I thought a lot of moments were really entertaining. I don't think they needed the chapter subtitles, where they're, like, yeah. chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. That was, you don't need, like, just, just have it flow like a real movie. Let's talk a little bit about the cast. So we, we talked about uh, the hottie Tom Blythe, 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 Blythe as uh, Snow. Um, and then you have Rachel Zegler as Lucy Gray Baird or Lucy Gray. They're, do you think they had chemistry together? No. <laughs> Me neither. When she Also, I felt like it was really forced at the beginning because right in their first interaction, she's like, you're supposed to be protecting me. And I'm like, what about this random man that showed up that's like blonde hair, blue eyes. Come on. It's not historically he's not somebody you should be trusting. <laughs> You're just like, yeah, this guy, this guy's who I'm putting all my like chips under. I don't know. I was just like, what? Why? Yeah, I thought I thought it would be more distrust at first too. Uh that she got right into Well, I mean, he kind of had that thing where he was like like if you don't listen to me, like you're going to die. Like I'm here to help you. I guess yeah. that's like a fairly compelling case, but also I would love to have seen it be a compelling case. I don't know. Yeah, and maybe she's like, you know, naturally a trusting person. I saw in an interview, Rachel Ziegler said, like, um, this character is a performer who's been forced to fight, which is the opposite of um, Katniss, who is a fighter who's been forced to perform. But still, um, she, you know, talks at the end near the end of the movie about how she had not been accepted by her community because her family was nomadic and all this so you would think that with that kind of lifestyle somebody would be a little bit more hardened and under like would be a little bit more distrusting of their oppressor but i guess not i don't know it was not a very um realistic depiction of how I think, but maybe that's just like, they're just showing like a toxic relationship. They definitely are showing that, but I think you're right. I think they needed to figure out what they were trying to say with that character. Because I don't really understand what she stood for. Yeah, Um, they both tried to make her like a strong female character standing on her own, independent. And also like, I don't know, maybe that's fine. But then she also was very like trusting of this random man at the beginning right so yeah yeah i don't i don't know um i think she had her moments as a character even i think her moments as a character were just like charming movie screen moments like when they come back to district 12 or he comes back to district 12 and he sees her on the stage in that underground bar and she's just like performing i was like oh this is kind of fun like she's she's good she's good at like doing this um but not, it wasn't the character. It was just like you know that that setting and the, what that what that energy does on screen is like always going to be fun. Um, I also wanted to shout out three of the big stars that they had in this movie that kind of like rounded out the supporting cast. You had Viola Davis as the uh, head game maker, which she was like really good and really crazy. 
Um, I almost wanted more of her. Uh, Peter Dinklage as the dean of the academy, who's like always drunk. I thought I thought he was really good up through his final scene, and then you have one of my favorite parts of this movie is Jason Schwartzman as uh, the host, the Flickerman, uh, Lucky Flickerman. I guess is like, do you know the? Really, he's definitely a a relative of Stanley Tucci's character from the original series, but I don't know what the the character's relationships are, like great great grandfather father or something. I think it's dad. Oh, just straight up dad. Okay, yeah, that makes because sense. Snow yeah. is older, an older gentleman in the Hunger Games, so it's like. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. That makes sense. Maybe it's grandfather. Um, Who knows, who's to say? I don't know. I thought he was really funny. And he had this, like... <laughs> they, they almost, like, didn't really even let him... I think his cheekiest moments were, like, not even on screen. Like, you just hear him in the background. Like, he's, yeah. like, commentating the games. And he had some really great remarks. My favorite one was, like... <laughs> when you say he was like oh and there comes walking pneumonia or something like that when he was yeah, like that girl that who was really so sick good. it's like tuberculosis on legs <laughs> so they, so yeah that's what it was so good because <laughs> <laughs> it's like in that moment i was like i didn't want to laugh but it was like funny which i think is perfect for the movie because that's exactly what was happening it's like he's m- making fun of something that's like really tragic so i just thought everything about it worked really well and i feel like I- i'm sure there was a lot of improv going on uh, which is is always fun. Um, yeah. Anyone else in the cast you want you want to shout out? I guess like the his classmate, his friend, Josh Andres Rivera. Uh, Sejanus Plinth. I liked yeah. him. He was he was in West Side Story with Rachel Zegler. Yeah. Do you know they're dating? They met on that movie, and now they're dating. Oh, I had no idea. Wow, that's fun. yeah. And initially, um, Rachel Zegler. Um, so this part was offered to her and she said she couldn't take it because she wanted to go home and visit her family because she had just been finished shooting a different project and um then she found out her boyfriend was doing it and she's like okay never mind i'm gonna i'm gonna do this movie so <laughs> yeah when i say family her. i meant boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> hey hey sometimes you just need one family member okay <laughs> no 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 i get it um, um so yeah, so they, that's kind of cute. Maybe they should have. Maybe he should have been Snow. Then <laughs> they would have no, had chemistry. No. Um, well, they definitely would have had chemistry, but no, that guy. Yeah, that guy needed to die in the first movie. <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> he was not gonna live. Um, yeah. Speaking of his character, some really dark moments in this movie that worked really well. All the hanging stuff on the hanging tree, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then the moment where Snow shoots that girl yeah that felt like it was a different movie like that entire scene that entire act or whatever it felt like i was watching a play or something i don't know the way that it was framed and shot the way that they were interacting with one another it felt like they were doing like theater and it was randomly in the middle of this movie but i think it worked well i liked it yeah it's like the whole final hour was his whole arc all over again like when he comes into district 12 he's like I'm here to do good, but he's still got that intensity. And then by the end of it, you're like, oh, he's bad. And yeah, I I, I liked a lot of those dark moments. I will say something you said at the beginning of the podcast really rings true for me. When by the end of the movie, Rachel, the idea of Rachel's character, Lucy Gray getting shot, didn't like, didn't really emotionally affect me. And so when it's revealed that like, oh, maybe she was shot, but like she ran away or like she's fine or something. I was like, okay. And then the final, I don't know if you felt this, but like there's a moment. So like he shoots her, he goes to her body, she's not there. And then there's like five whole minutes, just 300 seconds, I think. It felt like a long time of like nothing really. He's just kind of walking and then he hears her singing in the distance or whatever. And I felt like that was just I don't know, weird pacing, weird editing. But I was like, from the moment he shoots her to the moment she's singing needed to be like half the time. Because the whole I was literally sitting there like, yo, like what? What's going on? Like, are they confused? Like, <laughs> what am I supposed to be watching? I knew the movie was ending. Like, he's evil now. Like, the movie has to end within five minutes. And I was like, they better not. They better not end with like a shot of the trees and just fade to black. I was like, this might be the stupidest ending of all time if it ends in these woods. <laughs> I guess that's because it's supposed to be depicting his like um, fall into like this paranoia because he gets bit by the snake. So technically, he's supposed to be like um, hallucinating and drugged and like he's oh i did not get that at all which is what they're what they're trying to get at because he like 
And he's he's like supposed to be debating if she intentionally hid that snake under the right, um, or if if that was a a coincidence. But yeah, I mean, I liked it. I I, I thought it was nice because he was like really attractive, just walking around scared. But <laughs> that's not a that's not <laughs> that's not an argument you can make for you. Can't be like, no, it worked for me. He's hot. Like whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you can't. It, it definitely like heightened my viewing experience, you know. That's fair. That's fair. So I I also want to reiterate that you only thought he was hot once he was fully deranged. Everything before <laughs> buzz cut and all, you were like, sure, but not really. No. And then you were like, oh yeah, he's gonna murder her. Fuck yeah, I mean, I'm into this. Like no, I liked him as a military man. It was good. <laughs> right, right. I forgot. War, war is the moniker. <laughs> yeah. Hottie, hottiness. He has to be in some sort of uniform. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't really care for like the yeah the her being like no I'm gonna go get some catness and then, and then oh yeah that was that was the know. one that was the one connection that like did not need to be presented the way they presented it. I did in general I liked the connections that they made to the first Hunger Games or like the, the original series, like the Hanging Tree song. And like just like little references to the the games, um, and then like uh, the game host being like the same energy. Like I like those things. I probably could have used a, like one or two more, but just not so on the nose. It's like this is called Katniss. Yeah, she says it so many times that when she's dying, she's like, "I'm gonna go plant some Katniss or dig up some Katniss." I was like, okay. Yeah, I was like, if you want to do some sort of metaphor, like do that but this isn't working like this isn't doing anything for me yeah we shouted out james newton howard good score nothing like super crazy i feel that way about his scores a lot i'm just like nothing super crazy but like i had a good time yeah fun time with the music um Um, how did you feel about like the friendship between i think that was the most affecting relationship for me or the really the like the the relationship that i was the most invested in was sejanus and um snow's relationship um and i how, did you did you like believe did you buy in the beginning that they actually cared for one another or i don't know how, what were what was your take on it i always i i i like the de- depiction of it a lot and i think it worked well i don't think that i i don't think they wanted me to buy that they were best friends in the beginning i think like from those first moments they're never re- they're never on the same page. Mm-hmm. Like they sometimes think they're on the, on the same page, but they're truly not. Like they're both doing if they're both agreeing about a decision, they're doing it for like opposite reasons. Like even in the beginning when he was like, "Hey, like there's not you're not going to get your award today or whatever." Like from that moment, Snow is like, "I'm going to do whatever it takes to get what I want." And his friend Janus is like, "I'm going to do whatever it, it it takes to like do the right thing." Mm-hmm. which sometimes those align and sometimes most of the time they don't and I, I i like the dichotomy of that a lot i think you're right i think that was probably probably the relationship that worked best in the movie can we talk about the birds for a sec we say in the birds are they're controlled like that they're controlled like a, with a button like a <laughs> yeah i didn't get that either. like a cheap like a 1990s <laughs> like fan switch yeah i don't know i thought that the jabber jays just kind of said whatever you like a parrot but yeah, I thought so too. I didn't know they record. I thought they recorded everything. Like, I, see, I what's not explained is like at the hanging tree, they're recording. I'm not sure if they're recording, but they're repeating back everything that's being said under the hanging tree. By the way, amazing stuff when the Jabber Jays are just like yelling some like really dark shit because it's like the last words of people. That's really yeah. fucked up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. Maybe the, maybe you can leverage their technology. Maybe that's what they were showing. Is like they're capturing the jabber jays and like hooking them up to their technology so they're controlling when the recording and playing is happening uh probably could have used like a 30 second blurb on that and maybe there was and i just missed it you know also the jabber jays sing her song at the end but they didn't she didn't press the on button on those uh, are you sure they, they, they just didn't show it. oh my sister just told me those are mocking jays and that's different those are different how are they different Mocking Jays just copy, and Jabber Jays are like a genetically enhanced version that you can control with the recording. What does what does the word Jabber mean? 
<laughs> I think it's jabbing, you know? So, jabber? No. Well, you, well no. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, jabber are violent because they, they jab you. <laughs> yeah. um, according to Merriam-Webster, it means to talk rapidly, indistinctly, or unintelligibly. That doesn't really make sense, but sure. Yeah, sure. They're different. They might, that might, I guess that, that solves our question. But I didn't realize that Mockingjays and Jabberjays were both existent in this world. I knew like Mockingjays existed because the movie's called Mockingjay, but I was like, maybe they're just calling a Jabberjay a Mockingjay. From what I remember in the books, Mockingjays are part Jabberjay and part Mockingbird. Oh, okay. So... I would they love are like an just anomaly. Like 30 minutes on birds in one of these movies. Because <laughs> the whole thing is named after a bird. There's a bird on every That's character. True. Not character. Every every cover, every poster. Yeah. It's this goddamn bird. We know nothing about it. What if the bird was called Katniss? That would have worked better for yeah. me. I know. Instead of they a made fern. some potato Katniss. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be sad if my parents named me after a potato. But I guess that's what they used to do back in the coal country. I don't know. They used to just look around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quick, what do we name her? Ah, oh, shit. Oh, there's a potato. Yep. <laughs> yeah. This is my daughter, Roma. Uh, it's tomato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is my third third uh, son, Cucumber, and my fourth, <laughs> Zucchini Cucumber. The names of this Z-C-Sha. movie, these movies are, like, really bad, and they're supposed to be, like, represented. I don't, I don't, Susan Collins, why'd you make all the names bad? Like, the bread guy's name is PETA? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like J.K. Rowling levels of, like, oh, uh, Asian character? Cho Chang. <laughs> yeah, the exactly. fuck was she thinking? <laughs> it's That's like nuts. the non-racist version. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm looking up where Suzanne Collins is from. All right, she's from Hartford, Connecticut. Very close to you right now. Ew. Or not right now, but normally you know, in school. Yeah. Uh, but she did go to uh, Birmingham for college, and then she went to... Indiana University, Bloomington as well. Nice. So yeah, not not that much time in the South, I guess, college in Birmingham. I know, for making so many, like, Carolina characters, setting every single thing in her car- in the Carolinas. I, I think the reason, uh, if I had to guess, because she, she, you said she was a TV screenwriter. I think the reason she said it in North Carolina was at that time, in like the late 2000s, early 2010s, mm-hmm. there was like a lot of credits for filming in north carolina that's why like for 10 years or something there was a lot of stuff being filmed there so i think she literally was like oh like we can go film there for cheap and it makes sense i'm just gonna make it north carolina i think there's no other reason everything was filmed in north carolina back then yeah yeah i think film productions like were getting a lot of tax credits or like incent tax incentives rather to like Mm -hmm. go film in certain locations and north carolina for a while i don't remember the la la land year 2015 2016 was like one of the last years where north carolina was really rewarding that and then that's kind of died down so we don't really see too much of of that anymore but you know we had a good run also i have a question is snow just supposed to hate katniss because it reminds him of his (sighs) ex-girlfriend see now i i don't know because now i want to rewatch the first movie because that's like probably when they talk the most about real stuff. I feel like everything else they talked about in the later movies were just like weird code. Yeah. Like, I don't get it. Yeah, like in the second one, he, he's like, make me believe. And then that's basically all they say to each other. I don't, I don't, I don't get it either. Um, maybe, maybe it's because, yeah, like, A, she reminds him of her. B, she's from District 12 and she's like trying to fight the power and that's where he went. Yeah. She kind of maybe she kind of reminds him of Sejanus or something. I don't know. It yeah. could be multi layered. Reminds him of her, his youth. I'm wondering. I don't know. I, I it's fun to think about Katniss singing the Hanging Tree and what that did to Snow when he heard that. I, know. I don't really remember his reaction to the, hearing that the first time. But that would be a really cool thing to go back and look for. Is like, did, did they did they plan that actually, or was it like now when you go back there like. He didn't react once to that. To that song. He's like, "What the fuck are you saying, bitch? I don't remember this song at all. I don't know who this is." <laughs> yeah, I don't remember if he even reacts to it. If they include that, I mean, I don't think Suzanne Collins thought this through. I don't no. think she laid. This isn't like Lord of the Rings where everything connects and what Hunger or Game of Thrones where like, oh yeah, remember in season one when you said that three words and season six <laughs> you said that again. It's like that. That's not really happening. So. It, 
I feel like it's probably going to be a little, a little a letdown to like go back and watch for snow reactions, but I don't know. I still think that I feel like this will give a different meaning to a lot of the Tucker Games movies, and I think like I think they're probably planning a trilogy here as well at least. And I'm excited because it could line up with like I don't know. I feel like it could line up with like 20 or on the 20th year anniversary of the original Hunger Games. We start to see all of them kind of like come back to theaters or something. Uh, or just like, I don't know. I think anniversaries are really fun for movies, but a lot of movies that don't end up aging well don't get them. Mm-hmm. Um, 2023 is the 20th year anniversary for the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. And I'm like, we're not really talking about Pirates of the Caribbean anymore, especially because they made like sequels in the last like six to seven years, which are like bad. But I don't know. It's like fun when they're like, hey, we're going to bring back Titanic for the 30th year anniversary or whatever, 25th year anniversary. I think that the, also the difference is like, no, like everybody has seen, heard too much about Johnny Depp recently and like nobody wants to listen to him, about him anymore. Fair. For fair. like the recent future. But like people want to know what's going on with Jennifer Lawrence and Josh Hutcherson because like they, I mean, they've still been acting, of course, and they're still making like, you know, blockbusters in their own right. But. <clears throat> Um, I think that they have not been in the zeitgeist as like intensely as they were when they were a part of this franchise. So, and they had great chemistry. I remember that press tour in like 2015. They were everywhere, and they were so fun. A lot of clips are resurfacing of them, and yeah, it, yeah, it was very fun. Because Jennifer Lawrence is like a charisma machine, and so she plays off of a lot of people well, but they had good chemistry too, like in the movies and whatnot. So yeah, it was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember anything with Liam Hemsworth in it promotionally. He was always there. <laughs> I think. <laughs> he was. He, that was the Miley Cyrus era. Like they were yeah. doing their own thing. Yeah, and also I feel like that's that's how I felt about him in the movies. He was just there. I'm glad he's there. <laughs> <laughs> I just found a fun fact. You want to hear it? Yeah. Um. Lucy Gray, main character in this movie, named after a poem from 1799 by William Wordsworth called Lucy Gray. Oh, fun. Wait, is that the poem that she sings? Does she sing a poem? Yeah, she does. Yeah, you're right. You're right. William Wordsworth is also credited on the soundtrack for Lucy Gray, part (laughs) one and part two. Damn. How would he feel about that? He'd probably be like, yo, this is amazing. I'm kind of running out of things to say about this movie. Me too. It was good. Good, not great. But it, that also makes it, makes it sound like it's not worth watching. I think it actually is worth watching. Especially if you, like, A, liked the Hunger Games movies, but also just, like, it feels less like a Hunger Games movie. It feels more like a... I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example of a movie with an anti-hero that is, that is comparable. I literally am thinking... I was about to say The Godfather. I'm like, this is not what that is. <laughs> 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 that anti-hero, you know. No, I think it's novel. Movies. You know, it's a novel concept. A YA movie that's centered around um, a popular villain. I guess it's like um, Maleficent. But Maleficent's good. Uh, so it's not like that. I, it's, it's one of the only YA movies I've seen <laughs> where, like, the moral... Um, it's, an, it's a new take on a story, and the moral is new... Uh, where I guess the point of the story is like becoming evil is not something that's born within you. It's the decisions you make. Right. Which I appreciate. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think I think it had some good stuff to say, especially as like a kids or teen movie. I realize like the best modern example of what this is is Joker, Walking <laughs> Phoenix. Yeah. Like, basically, basically it's Joker, but it's Hunger Games, and it's oh my like, god, it's kids bop version. It's Kids Bob Joker, um, which I think is like a, arguably a more entertaining form <laughs> of what Joker was. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and talk bad about Joker, but, you know. Um, any last thoughts on The Hunger Games? I guess, like, The Hunger Games came out Thanksgiving weekend, so we're, we're a couple of weeks out of that, obviously. We're actually heading into, like, peak holiday movie season, where now it's like every movie is coming out, which is... I think a really fun time, but also can be overwhelming for audiences. Uh, among the slate of things that are coming out, among the slate of things that are available for streaming, is this a movie that you'd be like, you should you should kind of make room for this? Or are you kind of like, you can watch this in a year or two and it doesn't really matter? Oh, you mean this movie? 
Yeah, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Yeah, I think it's a great holiday movie, especially if you have like a whole family that you want to cater to. Like, this is a movie to watch in theaters. Like, um, I know my whole family went and saw it when we had like visitors in town for Thanksgiving, and it was a perfect movie to like. Um, everybody liked, everybody knows The Hunger Games enough to appreciate the story. Um, go watch it. I think it's it's worth your time for sure. We should we, you should hop on the pod for um, a movie that you like loved. Let's do like a like we can do a May December pod or we can do another pod about a movie that you liked from this year. Do you want to do I'll I'll cut this part out, but do you want to do a um the greatest movies of 2023 pod with me? Yeah. Or we just okay. like make a list and go or through it. Or can I do the worst movies of 2023 with you? I feel like that's more what we need to do. I feel like you need to do that with somebody who actually cares about the greatest movies of 2023. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Let's do the worst. <laughs> I have a lot I have a lot of nominees for the worst movies of 2023. Yeah. Cuz like yeah, I don't think I'll have any good smart additions for the greatest movies. So. Okay, yeah. I'm down. Yeah. Uh listeners, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed this podcast about Hunger Games. Keep that little child alive in front of you, in front of you, inside of you. Uh, Keep that young adult alive. Keep children inside of you at all times. And we'll see you next week. (laughs) Special thanks to my lovely girlfriend, Kuba Patel, for the podcast's artwork. And my good friend, Kevin Cow, for the music that you're listening to now. You can find more of his music on Instagram at Beats. Thanks, y'all.